my part of this presentation um, is the one that basically sets the stage for everybody else. Um, and we're going to talk about the beginnings of the Sheboygan County Historical Society and the beginnings of the museum collection. Um, so you should not find it all surprising uh, that we're going to go back in history. Um, we are talking about something that is thousands of years in the making. Um, museums as a general idea actually go back well into the past. Um, there is a fairly succinct argument um, that maybe cave paintings are the earliest example of a museum. This idea of humans and we want to preserve our stories and collective experiences um, for those that are going to come after us. Um, but the reality is that in a more concrete way, the idea of museums goes back to uh, Greek culture and Greek influence. So uh, the word itself is derived from the Greek um, and that word is based on all the sites that were dedicated to the nine muses. Those were the patron deities of the arts. Um, music, literature, um, art, history, the humanities, all of these things fit into that. And um, art came to be a part of everything in Greek life. It wasn't always interpreted. Um, it wasn't always organized. It just was everywhere. Um, and you see that yet today in things like the Acropolis, and you see that in the ruins of Greece. Um, and in fact, I have a friend who's been posting pictures because she was just on a trip there. And it is amazing um, because you can see where the idea of museums really starts. Um, so that being said, this idea kind of stays somewhat stagnant and it stays very focused in art um, up until uh, basically the early parts of the 14, 15, 1600s. And what we see there is that collecting and collectors and this focus on art kind of stays, um, but it takes a while. And it is really with a couple of individual collectors and a couple of major institutions that we really see, start to see what we think of, what we would recognize today as a museum start. One of those individuals who had what is often referred to lovingly as a cabinet of curiosity um, was Sir Hans Sloan. And he had a collection of over 71,000 objects, which is saying something. When he died in the mid 1700s, that he left to the King of England books, natural history specimens, relics from across the globe. And what essentially he does is he leaves this to the king. The king combines it with the libraries of three other basically prominent individuals Sir Robert Cotton an earl and the old royals library and they open what is essentially the british museum in the montague house in 1759 and you can see that pictured there um, on what should be you guys's right hand side and this sort of marks the beginning of very formal museums that are primarily of a national nature um, others that open in 1819, the Prado Museum opens in Spain with their royal collection. The Louvre opens in 1793 following the French Revolution when the government bas basically nationalized the king's property. The Hermitage, which is founded by Catherine the Great in 1764, opens to the public in 1852. 
And all of these look very similar. There's books, there's natural history, and there is what are often referred to as relics. They're kind of these fascinating pieces of historical objects. So the experience here in the United States is pretty much very similar. Um, wealthy families are acquiring materials, especially artwork, for private collections. And then there are some that are attempting to mimic what's happening in Europe and beyond with institutions for the public. Um, one of those individuals is Charles Wilson Peel in Philadelphia. So he is an artist, as you can see from the photo, that is a self-portrait of himself that he painted, opening the curtain up to his collection. He actually, in 1784, opens his home with 44 portraits that he had painted of individuals from the American Revolution. And over the coming years, he starts adding art pieces, natural history specimens, because he realizes that there's a market for people to come and view this created collection of items. Uh, he continues to add household ob objects, weapons, and even what he refers to as historical relics um, up until the time he dies. Um, and then his family attempts to continue it. But within about 20 years of his death, in 1849, the family is finding difficulty competing. His collection is sold off, in some cases, to the likes of P.T. Barnum um, and the Wild West shows. And that collection basically scatters across the globe. There are still pieces of it in institutions today, um, but as a whole, it, it no longer exists. Right around this same time, there is a British scientist who leaves his wealth to his nephew, Henry James Hungerford. Hungerford dies shortly after in 1835, and James Smith Smithson had said, in his estate that should his nephew die without any family, that his entire estate was to go to the United States of America to found at Washington under the name of the Smithsonian Institution, an establishment for the increase and diffusion of knowledge among men. Um, and after a bit of waylaying and hand wringing, uh, Con Congress accepts his offer in July of 1836. And there we have the st start of the nation's probably largest collection, the Smithsonian. So all of these collections have this really strong focus on art. They have this strong focus on natural history and natural history specimens. Um, and this is what we find as the nation is developing museums um, in the 1800s. So what's happening here in Wisconsin, right? At the same time, within years of Wisconsin's gift and some of the more prominent art institutions starting, we have the Wisconsin Historical Society. Um, historical societies had begun to slowly appear across the country at state levels to preserve historical treasures and relics. So there is this recognition that there is collecting going on of natural history. There is collecting going on artwork, but that there needs to be something that really addresses history, particularly, and historical relics. I will tell you that the reality is there is a lot of squiggles in these lines that are being drawn. Um, communities are increasingly establishing their own museums. 
similar to that that was in large museums. Smaller places are leaning into have heavy natural history collections along with their historical relics. So before Wisconsin even becomes a state, the Wisconsin Historical Society is founded. 1846, it's formerly, formally chartered into the state's constitution in 1853. Um, and it takes about four attempts for it to really stick. And part of what gets it to stick is the arrival of Lyman Draper in 1853. He is a paid secretary. Um, and in addition to collecting archival and library materials, the organization starts having displays um, in the state capitol building. And what you see on the left there is a photograph of a um, Daniel Webster, who obviously not a Wisconsinite, but a fairly prominent figure at the time. It is his um, wagon carriage that the Wisconsin, what today we know as the Wisconsin Historical Society, but the State Historical Society manages to procure. Um, it is <clears throat> one of the earliest institutions here in the state that is collecting, okay? Shortly thereafter, um, there is the Milwaukee Public Museum, which actually begins with a collection gathered by the principal of the German English Academy in Milwaukee. Um, Peter Engelman, he's going out, he is encouraging um, people to bring back, especially natural history specimens, um, and occasionally they're getting other items and pretty fast the collection outgrows their ability to handle it. And a Milwaukee alderman who happens to also be associated with this natural history society that starts in conjunction makes arrangements for Milwaukee to accept the collection and the Milwaukee Public Museum opens in 1884. Um, and I think you guys will find it interesting, especially as we start talking about what happens in Sheboygan, um, that from 1898 until 1963, the Milwaukee Public Museum shares space with the public library. Uh, this is a refrain that we're going to hear time and time again. So this idea of having affiliations and getting advice from these organizations that are actually already started really starts to get a hold as the 50th anniversary of the founding of the state of Wisconsin is approaching. So 1897, the Historical Society is out there and they are really encouraging the development of what at that point they call auxiliary societies um, to start at the county level. Newspapers are running clippings uh, with circulars and letters being sent to citizens and teachers and county clerks. Then there's this encouragement to gather up the history of counties up until that point and submit them to the State Historical Society. Likewise, they're also really encouraging the, this focus on Civil War stories and pioneer settlers. Um, and it seems like, honestly, this centennial celebration doesn't get a rush of historical societies, um, but it starts the process. Um, so, Green Bay starts a historical society affiliated in 1899. And by 1906, Sauk County is joining, Manitowoc County is joining, Ripon is joining as well. And so there's this slow process. So in the meantime, what's happening in Sheboygan, right? Well, 
our own backyard does have some efforts. So in 1921, there is an effort that is again undertaken. Um, and a lot of it is documented in the Sheboygan Pioneer, which is essentially a once monthly supplement that runs. Um, so it's published by Alfred Marshner um, and has a lot of these same kind of themes that we've heard already, right? We want to preserve history. We want to record it before it's gone. Um, we need to document things like our pioneers. We need to document a civil war, all of those things. So part of what they're looking to do, you can see, is replace the old Settlers Club. Um, this is an older organization that by now had really languished. Um, and it's really, it, it's really an interesting thing because as we're looking at documenting this and documenting the Sheboygan Pioneer, it's a tough search because when you search Sheboygan Pioneer in the 1920s, it's a lot of obituaries for pioneers, pioneer families, those kinds of things. They want to create a club-like atmosphere. And it is truly a club-like atmosphere. Um, I know it might be a little bit difficult to read, so let me just highlight a couple of the things. They want a club complete in all its equipments and modern equip in all its appointments and modern equipment to serve as a community center for all the members from all parts of Sheboygan County. They can drop in casually or by appointment. There'll be refreshments, there'll be a kitchen, there'll be a bath and entertainment facility. It's open year round for social and business appointments. And that it will be a place where members will feel free to spend an hour or a day. Best part of this, towards the very end, he mentions that they would also want to collect and maintain a historical archives of Sheboygan County Pioneerdom. So it is truly, in a lot of ways, initially looking to be a club, a gathering organization. Well, it doesn't take long uh, for Marshner to have some suggestions made to him. Um, and by August of 1922, so we're within six months, um, he indicates in his monthly pioneer article that perhaps there should um, be a change to the organization, um, that maybe it needs to be more inclusive of those interested in history, and that there is this promise of help from the State Historical Society um, that would assist. And he generally sees the organizations as having a similar purpose. And you can see the advertisements that are running in his publications. It definitely has that pioneer feel um, going back to the names and the institutions that have long been established. And by November, um, Marshner is presenting a dual organization. Um, he's found many that are interested, but feel they won't be eligible as they were not pioneers or descendants of pioneers. And so essentially there will be a historical society that would have an auxiliary with a separate membership that would be limited to just pioneer descendants exclusively. And people could be members in both. So with that, the hard work of establishing the Sheboygan County Historical Society really gets underway. Um, and it flies through um, with, um, sorry, uh, 
it, it kind of flies through and it takes about six months for everything to happen. Articles are drawn up. Mr. Buchan, who many of you will recognize the name because he wrote kind of the best history we have, is writing up these articles of incorporation. And by May, they've been approved by the state of Wisconsin. The first annual meeting is held on June 7th, and officers are elected on June 11th of 1923. And so I know a few of you have heard me say, it's kind of tough to pick a birthday for the historic, a, a hard and fast date for the birthday of the historical society. Do you go with the articles were submitted? Do you go with they were approved? Do you go with the first annual meeting? Do you go with the first organizational meeting? So that's kind of where that comes from. They also real quickly run this advertisement that you can see that is not only encouraging people to join, but also encouraging people to make donations, right? Um, and these are some of the things that they get really early on. Uh, the second annual report and collection of the State Historical Society for 1855. A History of Northern Wisconsin to 1881, inclusive. A copy of Edwards' 1868 to 1869 City of Sheboygan Directory, which is actually something that utilizing that copy eventually was able to be reprinted. We have a copy of it in our reference library in the back, and I can't tell you how often I actually look at it. And one of my favorites that gets mentioned is a early copy of the Sheboygan Mercury, um, which was one of the first newspapers. Doesn't say what date it was or anything like that. And it's just one issue of it with, quote, some tooth marks of a rodent, perhaps <laughs> looking for some good historical data. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they were just looking for some good reading material or a home. Um, so meanwhile, while this is happening, and I kind of jokingly say, meanwhile, across the street, because literally there are things happening in a number of places that are almost literally across the street from each other. So these efforts are supported. Um, there are people that are joining the organization. There are a handful of items coming in, but there are other collections and there are other museum displays during this time. In June of 1922, there is a note in the Sheboygan Pioneer that mentions a museum display that is happening in, um, sorry, I have to hop back, a museum display that's happening in the high school under the direction of Principal Urban. Um, we know, we know that at the same time, there are items that are in the public library. Um, the Jaron brothers had donated their collection to, it's kind of a complicated situation, but in 1910, they've placed their collection in um, the public library at time, awaiting an appropriate gallery or museum facility. The official transfer to the city happens in 1917. Um, for that particular collection. And if you walk out to our Native American gallery, that is, the Jaron collection is probably about half to two thirds of our Native American collection, things that were collected by them. They also offer space to the historical society um, in the south side on the second floor when they begin collecting as somewhere to keep some items. <clears throat> 
because they've got items there already. And so you can see this is kind of that south facing portion of the building. There is also in 1929 a display at Jefferson School, which has Oak as his principal. And so he has a, as he has a number of his items on display, um, along with several other items, including materials from um, Colonel Bourne's collection, a pewter plate, old books, and just a couple items that are mentioned as always being on display is also being on display. A piece of wood chewed by two beavers. Who doesn't <laughs> want that? <laughs> Some stuffed animals and birds, rifles, rattlesnake skins. I'm not entirely sure that we have those anymore. And honestly, even if we did, they have probably disintegrated by now. And old spectacles. So in addition to that, so we have Jefferson School having items. And finally, at the same time, we actually have a committee of the Daughters of the American Revolution as well. They have a collection that they are hoping to have put on display as well. And they are able to eventually find space in Lincoln School in 1932. Um, I will tell you, many of the items are actually transferred there from the library. The library is looking to get out of the museum business at that point. They need the space. Um, so the Jaron collection goes there. The bird collection ends up going there. And then some of the materials that are mentioned as being on display previously also end up there. We know that Colonel Bourne's collection ends up in the display at Lincoln School starting in 1932. So it's kind of an exciting time. But a change is afoot. Uh, so there is a new courthouse being built, right? Uh, right around the same time, 1933, the courthouse isn't sufficient for Sheboygan County, and they managed to, in part, with a lot of advocacy from several different individuals in the community, including E.A. Hickey, um, who is the clerk of courts, secure space in the new courthouse that is being built. And in 1934, when that courthouse is built, the Historical Society has a space. Um, and this is the point at which, essentially, all these things that have been held together across the city and by various organizations are slowly brought together under one organization. And we see that in the records. Um, the Daughters of the American Revolution collection um, comes to the Historical Society, and we actually have the handwritten register that was written there. We know that the birds come to the Historical Society. The Jaron collection comes to the Historical Society. And this is what makes up a lot of our early collection. Um, and as fits with the example that has been set, right, that we talked about really early on. There's a lot of natural history items in the collection. There's a lot of historical relics, which are interesting items of history. They're not necessarily local. There's personal collections. There's historical items related to other cultures. And um, so some of those items that you see in the exhibit, in those first kind of things, um, really fit into this. That piece of wood is from Commodore Perry's flagship Niagara. And not only do we end up with one piece, we end up with about four pieces that are supposedly from that flagship. 
um, and from two different donors, which is just fascinating. Um, a chair that is brought, that chair that is in the display. It's interesting, it's brought from Ohio to Sheboygan County, but there is a very specific and special note in there about the fact that it is related to somebody, the person who donates it is related to somebody that is part of the spirit of 1776 photo. And yet there are local items that are donated. So um, the, the violin that is in that section is in part composed of wood that was from that courthouse that was torn down. Colonel Bourne's collection, so that uh, soldier's handbook is from his collection of items. Obviously the large trophy that is in the center for Mexican border duty. That is something that is local. So it's really this interesting collection of materials that sometimes makes sense that it is local, sometimes makes no sense for why it came, other than it was a historical relic. And it fits with items that were of historic interest at that time. So, you know, the 1920s, 1930s, Egyptology, really exciting, really a big part of historical work at that time. They've just found King Tut's tomb. So all of these things kind of play a role in what our early collection looks like. And then there is the David Taylor factor. We couldn't go through this part of the presentation without talking about him. Um, and let me say that it is really interesting looking at the early history of the Historical Society, right? So the Historical Society has started, we're in the early 1930s, courthouse hasn't been built, there isn't really a home for a big exhibit. So the Historical Society is still doing other work and other history projects. One of those big projects is actually having a portion of the property that at, by this point is owned by the county designated as a historic park. Um, and this is a huge undertaking by the Historic Society. The efforts begin in 1931. It's written out in the minutes. And a lot of this is spearheaded by Charles Broughton. Um, they held their annual meeting in 1931 at the property as part of this effort. And within a year, the park area is established, incorporating the wooded glen that is essentially at the top of the hill. Um, improvements continue at that park. The Historical Society continues to meet there on an annual basis. They get a boulder and a plaque to dedicate in 1937. And, and this is all part of the efforts of the Historical Society. They're collecting, but they're also looking to recognize and mark historical sites throughout the county during the same period of time. They really are, are looking at this big kind of concentrated effort. And, and that's in part because of the examples that are being set and also advice that's being, being given to them. So, but at the same time, they aren't inherently um, interested in necessarily relocating out to Taylor Park. Um, and to the historic, um, to David Taylor's house. Um, as early as 1936, there were suggestions of moving uh, the historical society to the Taylor home, um, which is so interesting, right? It, it happens eventually, but in 1936, it, it wasn't a solution. In 1940, the Sheboygan Women's Club uh, further encourages this idea um, with a petition that they present to Sheboygan County um, and to the Historical Society. 
it's supported by a variety of individuals, um, military organizations, auxiliaries from across the country. Um, and what I like to think about is maybe maybe they saw the future. Maybe they saw what was coming um, because we're on the doorstep of World War II. Um, and World War II kind of changes everything. Um, as the war efforts ramp up, there is a, really, it's a pretty ugly debate. Uh, that begins about the presence of the historical society in the courthouse. Uh, many people felt that the museum had to move to make space for the rationing board. Others felt that there were other options available for the rationing board. Um, and it becomes pretty a, a, a pretty hotly contested thing. Um, and um, it leads ultimately, to an agreement um, that the historical society can stay in the courthouse in a small section, but by and large, everything is packed up into storage to accommodate the rationing board. So, so it's a good compromise during World War II. It kind of meets the goals of both organizations. There's a lot of concern about having to move all the objects. And it is probably that happening. It is World War II. It is what happens. It is that debate that ultimately leads to the historical society moving out to the farm, as it were. And in 1948, the historical society is given a 99-year lease for the Taylor home for the purposes of operating a museum. It takes six years to complete the preparations. Um, there are renovations that have to be done. There are changes that need to be made. There is space that needs to occur. And there is an entire artifact collection that has to get moved. Um, and from what I have found, it is six semi-trucks worth of goods that have to move from the downtown courthouse out to the Taylor house. Now, remember, those aren't 2023 semis. They're 1950 semis. But still, six semi-trucks. And as you can see in the photo... <laughs> The volunteers are called in. Uh, the State Historical Society steps in to help with documenting the variety of items that have been collected because things have continued to come in. Um, they are tasked with helping to repair some items, identify items, which in some cases at this point have little more than a paper tag that maybe is stuffed into a coat pocket or is clipped to a doc, um, clipped to something. I, excuse me. Um, and I know this in part because I still find those paper tags in things uh, to this day. Um, in fact, I think I actually left in the little Aztec picture that's out in the display, the paper tag that's kind of stuffed into the picture with the documentation about where it is. Um, so through 19, late 1952 through 1953, there's a lot of hard work going on. And it's actually supported in large part by the Sheboygan Women's Club at that point doing the documentation. And by 1954, the Historical Society was ready to open in grand style. And so you can see part of the invitation that was issued. You can see the crowd that gathered on the front lawn. And there begins the history of the organization in that home and utilizing it. So it takes a while to make it home, uh, to, to make it the museum's home, but it's also important to keep in mind at this point 
that it remains a home. Um, there is a family of caretakers that will live there. Um, and so what I have here for you is a, is a couple examples of photos of the earliest exhibits that were installed. And you guys should see some familiar items in there. For those of you that have come regularly in the last few years, um, the Andre bed you can see in the one photo. Um, you can see Dr. Um, Fox bicycle. That butter churn we still have in the collection. In fact, we recently just moved it um, as we're reworking the exhibit in the cheese factory. Um, the Historical Society operates on a fairly limited basis, primarily operating hours from April 1st to October 1st. Um, and there are other objects that are there that probably look familiar. Um, there is a story uh, in 1957 that mentions some of the items on display that year. And that includes a bloodletting machine used in a Sheboygan barber shop many years ago, a collection of shaving mugs, and a chair made by Darius Levins. All items that if you walk out into the main galleries, you're going to see there. I want to take a just a quick I'm going to take what we call a quick bird walk and I to share one of my favorite stories from when I first started. So that thumb lancet that's pictured on the lower right, um, that thumb lancet shortly after I started had a little, a, a little card that identified it as a bloodletting tool that had to be over 400 years old. Um, and I went to the catalog and I was like, okay. And there's, there's a little newspaper clipping. So if, if you don't know this already, I love old medical equipment. Um, most of my graduate work was done on medical history and medical objects and all of those kinds of things. And so this caught my eye because I knew that this wasn't a regular, true thumb lancet. Uh, it's called a spring lancet. And really the earliest it can be is from the 1750s. And more likely than not, it's probably from 1830s, 1840s, from a fairly prominent manufacturer. Um, so that was one of those things that I was like, Oh, you know, sometimes we do have to go back with the knowledge we have today and relook at the information that came in with something. Um, and I, I love that story in part because, first of all, like I said, I love old medical equipment. And I had done a ton of research on bloodletting and blood transfusions. So it gave me a chance to horrify a whole new group of people with with stories about what it used to be like um, to like donate blood and do blood transfusions. But I also love it because I think it just speaks to the fact that we never stop learning. We will never stop learning. There are always new discoveries being made. There are always new things happening. There's some really fascinating stuff happening right now in Egypt with technology and tunnels. So I'd love to be around 250 years from now because I think we'll just know so much more. So I also wanted to share this. I shared this actually with Travis. It's some notes from our annual meeting um, from 1962. And it made me laugh because there is just the indication that some things don't change so much. And the very end of it, there's an individual, Mr. Richards, and he asks for the floor and he's really quite upset. Uh, and I'm guessing perhaps something he had suggested donating is not accepted that the acquisitions committee 
um, that there is even a committee um, and that basically his opinion is everything should be accepted and everything should be put on display um, regardless, period, hard stop. <laughs> Remember, this is 10 years after we've moved six truckloads full of items to the Taylor house, right? Um, and I love the last sentence that the acquisitions committee is guided to a great degree by the total lack of storage space. So Bob, that problem started long before you, long before you. So second verse, same as the first, right? Um, this is also, I feel like a really good place to mention um, that this is a time um, where there are a lot of photos and documents coming into the collection and that will be, that will continue to be collected. And that lack of storage space along with other factors is, is going to lead to a split down the road um, for those type, types of items. Um, and hence why we have the Sheboygan County Historical Research Center. But it is also during this time that we really start to see distinctly Sheboygan County objects. Um, there are still familiar themes from the past, lots of personal collections of popular object, objects or good display materials. I see that noted a lot in the acquisitions records. Um, and you can see that in this section of the display. Uh, that dress was worn by First Lady Kohler to a party, the AP Lyman sign. But the doll in the display, the woman's hat in the display, those were all parts of larger collections of items that were particularly popular at that time. But it's really cool because we also start to see more and more objects that are no longer just old or pioneer. Um, something that up until the late 50s, the 60s, it isn't as common. Um, they weren't necessarily common items or everyday items. Lots of wedding clothes, lots of dress clothes, lots of fancy, but there is a change that we're starting to see to really collect and preserve that history for future generations. I think it's really important to just remember too, at this point, there are custodians that are not only serving um, the historical society, but they're also caretakers of the park as well. Um, William and Annette Erickson served from 1952 to 1961. Um, and from 1961 to 1973, Ted and Frieda Mosh serve as well. Um, and they work with a variety of people as curators each year to maybe change an exhibit or add a temporary exhibit. They're also serving as the primary contact for artifacts donated to the museum. There's still a committee, um, there's still a museum committee working, but, but these are in a lot of ways, the face of the museum for those years. Um, it absolutely cracks me up um, to also see that, uh, as, as the Mashas decide to retire, um, that one of the things that they find most difficult to deal with, um, and they're retiring in 1973, is the fact that there are hippies hanging out in Taylor Park. Um, it's it's not necessary. They're having it difficult to find somebody to live, be a live-in custodian. By and large, by this point, the house is dedicated to the museum. They're living in a small portion of the back of it. And yes, they're getting paid 
Yes, they have living facilities. But what gets talked about time and time again is the hippies that need to be, you know, they need to have somebody there to protect the museum um, in part from this situation. Um, so the county does hire a caretaker, Edgar Aschenbach, briefly um, in 1973. But in 1974, we also see another big development. And that is the arrival of George Lull. Um, for those of you who have, you know, had interaction with the Historical Society, he's a familiar, he may be a familiar name. He had retired um, from Boston store in Milwaukee as a window merchandiser um, and settled in Oostburg. And he starts redesigning these various exhibits and he has a great eye for exhibits. So this is 1974. There's another thing on the horizon, right? The next thing on the horizon is the bicentennial. And across the country, there is excitement happening for historical societies, for museums, for historic structures. The excitement is palpable. It is skyrocketing. And there are all these efforts, not only locally, but at national levels, to help support history. And so... George comes and does a very special parlor exhibit celebrating an 1890s wedding. You can kind of see on the screen there a, a shot from the newspaper along with partial photos of it um, that were taken, that we have copies of. They also actually set up a bicentennial room that has a bicentennial exhibit. And two, two of the first items mentioned are this rush bottom chair, um, which remember I was saying the Pfeiffer in the spirit of 70, 1776 photo, and that Darius Levin's chair shows back up again. Um, so things that we continue to value uh, in the collection today. And at the same time, the Taylor House is receiving the National Register recognition in, in uh, 1976. And this is sort of a turning point. The historical society at this point is really starting to think about what comes next. What is the next thing in this really exciting endeavor? And they're going to be ready to embark on it as they come out of these bicentennial celebrations. So that should leave you wondering what comes next, which is uh, a topic for next week's discussion. Um, I can take a handful of questions if anybody is interested. I, I might have to have somebody repeat them for me um otherwise thank you again i apologize profusely um i was super bummed at the very poor timing of this but i'm really glad um i could share some of this early history with you um heather and i have talked a little bit that maybe down the road we'll do something with the exhibit where um, I'm going to have real short blurbs that people can read, but maybe where I can walk through some of those items. There are some really fun stories uh, to share about some of those objects as well. It's true. We're talking about having an, an exhibit party as well. Maybe in September. We're filling that out. It's an exhibit that definitely deserves a party. If anyone has any questions, I can get Thank you, Mike. Nothing. That either means I did a good job or you guys are taking pity on me. Tamara, <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me like this? Yeah, I can hear you pretty well. Is it better if I use the microphone? 
Uh, no, it's, it doesn't actually matter. As long as you just kind of talk at the computer, it's good. Okay. Uh, I wonder, did you go over, maybe I was in the other room with snacks or something, but did you go over like how the collections from Europe, so many like European artifacts ended up over here? Um, I didn't specifically go over it. Um, there's a couple different things that happen. Let me see if I can get back to that picture. And did you, and were a lot of the early artifacts that were supposedly from other countries actually just things that were made in the United States to imitate other cultures? Um, you know, it's actually really a mix of things. So um, using uh, actually the, the photo on the upper right. Um, so is it's it's a good example for me it's a good example so what we have there is a um egyptian uh yushabi i think is the correct pronunciation um so this is an item that was actually often um do, uh, would have been found later on um in in tombs um and sometimes by the hundreds um but it's also something that was actually developed and then marketed as essentially a souvenir type item um especially as the big um tomb discoveries were being made in the early 1900s and they're they're finding a number of them and there's a lot of archaeology going on at that point um, that one is particularly interesting um, because we, from the same donor, his great great grandfather fought in the French and Egypt War that happened uh, in the late 1700s, and that's actually that strange vicious saber actually came from his great great grandfather. But at that time, those kind of these kind of items would not have been in, in 1798, I think is when it was, would not have been common. Um, but it could easily have been an item that would have been picked up later on in the 1900s as Egyptology becomes much more common. Uh, the picture in the middle is actually um, something that was brought back to Sheboygan County um, by somebody that had lived in Sheboygan and was coming back to visit family and actually was working down in um, British Honduras uh, at the time, which is what I think we call Belize now. And this was something that he had found while working there. He actually brings a number of things back in the 1920s from that area um, and brings them back with him as kind of souvenir items uh, to his family. And, and that's not uncommon. I mean, that's not uncommon today, right? We go out, we go on a vacation, we travel, okay, um, we used to do those kinds of things. Um, but, you know, we go out and we bring things back for the people that are back home, shoveling our snow or taking care of the dog or picking up our mail. Um, we bring things back for family. And some of those items that come from other countries, especially these early items, we are continuing to connect the dots. Um, those those shoes are referred to as Chinese shoes in the in the collection documentation. And that's about all we have. Um, so it would require a lot of additional resources and expertise to kind of make that determination. So sometimes we can figure it out um, or there is enough additional information that's recorded. And sometimes we're kind of stuck, especially with those early items. 
Um, but sometimes we can piece it together as well, which is, is really great because there's enough information, you know, if, if Joe Smith, there's a big article about him traveling to Germany and collecting items and bringing them back. And then there's a note about this German item donated by him down the road. We can sometimes make those connections logically. Um, and some of them are just, they're lost to time, which kind of stinks in a way. Um, but is the reality of a museum that has been collecting for a hundred years or, or longer, honestly, it just gets lost sometimes. I have a question. Is any is there any attempt being made right now to set aside things that are iconic to our life right now? Because in a hundred years from now, that's probably going to look as strange as some of these things we're seeing right now. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. Um, there is. Uh, there are some items out in the display um, that we have collected over the last the last couple of years. Um, we have collected some items. Um, from the pandemic, um, we have collected a lot of items from the PGA tournaments. Um, we continue to collect some modern items from some of the schools and things like that. Um, so yeah, we definitely, we definitely do that. It it's both a blessing and a challenge to do modern collecting, um, but it is something that we we actively are undertaking um, for a multitude of reasons. Um, and I think that's something too that I, Travis will probably address when in, in the last session for this, um, kind of the history and, and that's a big change. Um, you know, that's a big change from previously um, where it's, you, you know, something had to be however old or, or that's what people offered. So um, sometimes it's it's interesting. <laughs> uh, I, I, I we spend a lot of time um, having to reassure people that just because it's within our lifetime's remembrance doesn't make us old. Uh, it, it's just a lot easier to. Uh, to deal, to find some of these things and, and honestly to preserve them as well. Um, modern plastic sucks. Um, kind of like those rattleskins. I don't know. I, I don't know what's going to happen a hundred years from now, 150 years from now, but if we can keep it in a much more controlled environment than most of us live in, um, I think we, we stand a fighting chance. There's a great uh, COVID clinic sign in this exhibit. Okay. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think. We've got a speed of sense of urgency on it. Yeah. Any other questions? I want to know what she's drinking. <laughs> um, I am drinking tea, uh, okay. lavender mint. You'll yeah. notice it says namaste on the couch. It's probably been it might be backwards, um, but uh, yeah, tea is my best friend right now. It feels this straight. Straight, huh? Straight up. <laughs> no sense in wasting the good stuff right now. And your dog didn't bark once. I know, and there actually I'm impressed because there were sirens that went by. <laughs> and that's that's usually a surefire we're out. <laughs> I I I could hear it in the distance and I had my finger on the mute. <laughs> I can just sense the sense of community that yeah, that Tamara alluded to um that in her introduction really uh the sense of community that history brings us all together and it even brings you know, people together that aren't even with us anymore. Um, so we thank you for kicking us off on this centennial speaker series, Tamara.
and I implore you to come back. Um, everyone who's here because our next speakers are really pouring their hearts and souls into their presentations as well. Um, Betty Potter will be here next week presenting on building and buildings. Um, and it's really expansive. Um, and it was really fun to talk to her about how she's going to organize it. Um, would it be chronological? Would it be topic driven? Because everything is so interwoven. Um, and it's also been really exciting to talk to Bob about um, what is the title of yours? I'm the one that's talking about getting with the programs yeah. because um, he ushered in this season of um, featuring uh, other people's collections as well, a season of um, involving different community members, and uh, a new season with this main building too. It's not to be missed, and that will be the third week in March. And of course, Travis will be talking about what we are looking at in the future and who we are becoming um, according to who we've been. So I know that that's going to be a very dynamic talk as well. And he's living and breathing it. So I, I would also say that those three are also not to be missed. Thank you for not missing Tamara's talk. Myra, did you want to add something? Yes, I would just like to say a thank you to Heather, to Travis, to Tamara for that last minute work that you have put together so that we could see you tonight. <laughs> There was only a small amount of cursing yesterday. A small amount. Thanks for adjusting with us. It means a lot, and it's not ideal, but you know, it works. It's our world. So thanks for living in. I'd rather with hear us. from Tamara than from me or Heather. Sure. <laughs> kind of <laughs> Thank you all for coming out. And grab the camera. Start some tomatoes on your way out. <laughs>